Okay. Um, our outline for the class, last week, of course, we talked about the life and teachings of Rome, of Paul and the book of Romans. At the end of the class, the seventh week, I'm going to spend the first hour talking about the significance of Paul. I'm going to deal with some of the theological issues, but also some of the subsequent historical importance of Paul uh, before the final exam. This week, of course, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Next week, Galatians and Ephesians. Then Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians together, and then the pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. They're called the pastoral epistles because these were um, disciples, students, assistants of Paul's, and uh, he writes to them, both Timothy and Titus had taken major leadership roles. Timothy became the bishop in Ephesus, Titus became the bishop on Cyprus. And so both of them, as they were developing their own ministry, Paul is writing to them with instructions about being about their role as pastors. In effect, Paul is pastoring them by helping train them as to what it means for them to be a pastor. And so that's why they're called the pastoral epistles. And then, as I said, week seven, the significance of Paul and final exam. And here, again, photographs from different places I took of Paul. Again, I put, I put these up here because it's important to me to, to realize that there was a quite consistent understanding of what Paul looked like, even though obviously there was not photography available in that time. Um, these are from different countries, um, from Patmos, which is in Greece, from Istanbul, um, the church of uh, St. Cora. This one is in um, the church of Lydia near Philippi, where Paul baptized the woman, Lydia, and there's now a chapel there, the location where she was baptized. And so we have here uh, Timothy, Paul, and um, Luke, I guess. Um, who's, you'll notice him writing. He's keeping, keeping track of what's going on here. So Paul is always portrayed in very much the same way, always balding, as I say, always a handsome man. Um, we also have pictures frequently Paul and Peter will be, uh, like the picture on the left there, on the opposite side of an arch, there is an equivalent picture of Peter. Peter always has curly, thick gray hair and is always carrying keys because he was given the keys of the kingdom. But the images are quite consistent. Um, and this is how we picture Paul. The letters of Paul, this, and I, remember, all of this stuff is online. So any of these charts or graphs or materials, I actually think, I'm not sure if this one is in this book or not. Uh, I've got another book uh, similar to this that I may have taken it out of, um, which actually, they give you permission. It says, by buying this book, you have permission for, for reproduction as long as you don't do it for profit. So you can do it for classes and things. I'm very, I'm very careful about not violating copyright on this stuff. Uh, that's why a lot of the pictures you'll see that I use are pictures I took. That way I know that there's no copyright violations. But Galatians, which we will get to later on, is the first book chronologically in time sequence that Paul wrote. And then 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, then 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then Romans. We are following them according to the way they're listed in the Bible, because that's the way you're used to reading them. Um, the Old Testament and New Testament books are usually listed, once they're in groups, within those groups, like with, within Pauline letters, from the longest to the shortest. Romans is the longest of Paul's books, so it comes first, even though it was written in the middle of his ministry, not at the start. Philemon, the shortest one, is at the end. So we're following just to keep people from being confused. When I, when I started teaching the Old Testament survey, I taught it according to the, the organization in the Hebrew Bible, since, after all, the Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible. It was theirs before it was ours, even. And people got confused. You know, not horribly confused, but a little bit confused. Because, I, and I decided it's best for me to keep track, keep following the track of order that we have in our Bible. So. Today, we're dealing with 1st and 2nd Corinthians. I showed you this map uh, the other day. These are the major locations in Paul's life. He, of course, was born in Tarsus. Um, he lived in Jerusalem most of his life. That's where he was trained. It was on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus that he encountered the risen Christ and led to his salvation. He spent most of his ministry or adult life in Antioch. That was the base of operations. He and Barnabas planted the church in Antioch. And that was where he launched most of his travels from. Colossae, uh, which he wrote to and had visited. Ephesus, he spent the longest period of time of any um, church that he was involved with. He was almost three years there, between two and a half and three years. 
I say between because um, in the New Testament, in all of the Bible, they tended to generalize on times. And they'll say, you know, over two years, or they'll say two years plus, and so we have to sort of estimate. It's somewhere two and a half to three years. Uh, Philippi, he wrote a letter back to them. Thessalonica, he wrote a letter back to. Malta, he was shipwrecked on. Rome, of course, is where he eventually was martyred. And then we have Corinth. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about Corinth in a moment, um, but give you a little history in terms of his travels. This is the second missionary journey, which happened between 49 and 51 AD. We talked about it last week. Where he left from Antioch, he visited the churches in uh, Galatia that he had previously planted. Now, you notice Galatia is up here. This is the historic location of Galatia. The Romans, when the Romans took over all of the Mediterranean Sea, they became a Roman lake, as they called it. Galatia was all of this. And so the churches in Galatia that he writes to in the book of Galatians, we believe, are these churches. Then over to Troas, he crossed over the first time to Europe, visited Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. He got chased off by people from Thessalonica, thugs, who came and hunted him down even when he went to Berea. He caught a boat and went to Athens, and from there he went to Corinth. He spent um, 18 months or so in Corinth. He planted a church there. After Corinth, he left and went to Ephesus, which is where he spent between two and a half and three years. From Ephesus, Paul wrote back to the Corinthians. And um, actually, there is indication that Paul wrote four letters, not two, to the Corinthians. The first letter that he wrote, it, he refers to in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 as a previous letter. I have written to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. This is a reference to some previous writing that he has done, and it became known as the warning letter, because apparently from, from the references he makes to it, Paul was warning the Corinthians of things they need to be careful not to do. Well, then he gets a report that they were doing all of those things, that they were not being, being obedient to what he had taught them when he planted the church or what he had written to them. So he writes a second letter, which we know of as 1 Corinthians. The first letter is not available to us. Okay, it's lost. So the second letter he wrote is the first one we have, which we call 1 Corinthians. Then there is a third letter apparently that he wrote that we do not have, which he calls the severe letter, or it's referred to as the severe letter. Paul calls it the letter of tears, because apparently in that one, he wasn't just warning them anymore, he really smacked them upside the head and told them they were sinning, they were violating God's will, they better straighten up. And then he was worried that he had so offended them that he had broken the relationship. And he sends Titus to visit them to find out how, how did they receive that letter. He, during the time that Titus is gone is when he has the event in Ephesus of um, the silversmith creating a riot because Paul was teaching people not to worship the gods and the silversmith and other people who made God little idols for homes were getting their finances in, uh, were threatened and so they started a riot Paul had to end up leaving and he went up this is he went up from Ephesus he's up in this area of Macedonia he first he, he went up to Troas could not find um, Titus, he thought he was going to meet him there. He's really worried about how these people reacted. He goes over to Macedonia. Macedonia is this area, so probably Philippi, Thessalonica, somewhere up here, and meets up again with Titus. Titus reports to him they actually responded very well, and they listened to you this time. They're doing what you told them. They, they really do still love you, and so Paul is relieved. And Paul responds to that relief by writing the second letter that we have, which we call 2 Corinthians. So he wrote first a warning letter that we don't have. Then he wrote 1 Corinthians, which we do have. Then he wrote a really stern letter, what he called the letter of tears, or the severe letter. Uh, and then when he got a report that they really had listened and they were paying attention to him now and they really did still love him, then he wrote 2 Corinthians. And that's why... At least the first nine chapters of 2 Corinthians are much warmer. You know, when you get into there, he's talking about 
about how much he loves them and appreciates them and everything else, which is much milder even than the first letter we have to the Corinthian church. Um, there is some thought, since you all just read 2 Corinthians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, when you get through the first nine chapters, there's a sense of warmth and of reunion and of Titus is reported back and, you know, I'm really glad to hear you, you all are, are paying attention and that you look forward to my coming to visit you again. Then you get to chapter 10, and chapter 10 through 13 take on a harsh tone again. All right? Some of it quite harsh. One of two things apparently happened. The most likely, I believe, and most scholars believe, most evangelical scholars believe, that while Paul was traveling up here in Macedonia, he didn't write the letter all at one time. You know, he was writing some, and then he's traveling, and writes some, and travel. That somewhere along the, the way, when he was feeling really good about it, he got another report from Corinth that there was a, a minority in the church that was still causing problems and were still especially were claiming that he was not an apostle, that he didn't have any authority to speak. And Paul, therefore, finishes his letter, the last four chapters, 10, 11, 12, and 13 of 2 Corinthians, takes on a much sterner tone again because he's trying to correct the part of the Corinthian church that still is, is out of line. The other idea is that since Paul wrote a third letter called the Severe Letter or the Letter of Tears, um, which he was quite stern in, and we know that because Paul says, I was concerned that I had broken the relationship because I wrote so sternly to you. Some people have thought that, that 2 Corinthians 10 to 13 is actually part of that lost letter that got attached on the end of 2 Corinthians. Um, there's really not any strong evidence that we should break that letter in two, but that, that's one way of explaining, if that did happen, why the last four chapters are much more stern than the first nine chapters of 2 Corinthians. But I think it's probably more likely that Paul got a report in the interim, you know, while he was writing the letter, and ended up having to feel like he had to go back and, at least to a minority part of the Corinthian church and deal sternly with them, all right? So, um, Someday we'll get to read the two letters of Paul's that we don't currently have. Um, again, the church in Corinth. I want to talk a little bit about Corinth. <clears throat> the city of Corinth. Um, a fascinating place, truly. This is the city of Corinth. This is Athens. Over here you have Ephesus. This is modern-day Turkey, modern-day Greece. All, right? all of this was Greece. This section down here was the Roman province of Achaia, which was the largest part of what we know of as Greece today. You'll notice that there's a big peninsula here. This is the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Um, Corinth existed right on a narrow isthmus, and that was critically important for this, this uh, particular city. A little bit about the history. The city of Corinth had existed for um, centuries and centuries, but it was destroyed in the second century uh, BC by Romans because the Greeks were trying to rebel against Roman authority and to, to put them in their place. They sent in an army and they ended up destroying Corinth. Julius Caesar started rebuilding the city of Corinth in 44 BC, and then Caesar Augustus completely rebuilt the city in 27 BC, which means this is only about 30 years, a little less than 30 years, before Paul is writing, they completely rebuilt the city. So this is a brand spanking new city, rebuilt by order of Caesar Augustus, which means money was no object. If, if Caesar said, we're going to rebuild the city, then, doggone it, they rebuilt the city. And as a result of all of that, by A.D. 50, slightly before, uh, during the general time when Paul wrote this, we believe he wrote the Corinthian letters in A.D. 50 to 57. Around that time, Corinth was the fourth largest city in the whole Roman Empire, after Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch of Syria. Fourth city, Corinth. Far larger than Athens. Far more important than Athens in terms of the wealth, the influence, the commercial impact. Um, at one point, Corinth had a population of 250,000 people. Masumena. Now, for an ancient city, that's huge. We don't think 250,000 is that big nowadays, but that was a big deal back then. Um, it was a major metropolis, especially because it, of, of its location. Its wealth and prosperity came from the fact, from the fact 
that this is a very old map. This area here is the corner of the Peloponnesian Peninsula. This is the rest of Greece, so that Athens would be over here, okay? You'll notice how narrow this is right here. This is only three and a half miles long, and it is the area that connects the Ionian, or Adriatic Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, every major inlet you get to has a different name. You've got the Mediterranean, and then you've got the Adriatic, and then you've got the Ionian, each called the sea. Well, on this side, you have, you have the Mediterranean, and then you have the, um, the Aegean, and then this is the um, Saronic Gulf, as it's called. This area here, the three and a half mile isthmus that uh, Corinth was built on, was the shortest way to get goods from Rome and Spain and all of Western Europe and the cities of ancient Asia Minor, what we know of as Turkey, like Ephesus, all of the areas around the Aegean Sea, and even to Egypt and Israel, etc. Um, because this Ionian Sea, over here, of course, a little further, over there, um, is Rome, Spain, all sorts of places with trade. Here, Ephesus, down here you have Israel, Egypt, etc. The area around the Peloponnesian Peninsula was a very difficult way to sail. It was rough waters, there were a lot of uh, reefs, it's not, and it took a long time if you were coming from over here to sail all the way around here, especially if you're coming up to Athens or to Ephesus. The simple thing was to cruise in here into this area which was known as the, the, the Gulf of Corinth or the Gulf of uh, Lepanto and transport the goods three and a half miles from this Ionian Gulf over here over to the Aegean Sea. It was cheaper and faster than going a long way around. Well, of course, Corinth built a business out of this. And they had a, a means to get from one end to the other. They had a stone road that was especially built for transporting small ships. A small ship, they literally would lift out of the water and put on wooden rollers and roll it three and a half miles to the other side and then put it back in the water. If it was a larger ship, they would unload the ship, take the goods across in wagons, and put it on another ship. Medium-sized ships, they could even unload them and move the whole ship across as well, put it back in the water and reload it. Every time they did that, and it's said that the vast majority of goods traveling between Western Europe and the cities in Asia Minor and the East, almost all of the trade went through Corinth, and they charged a fee for all of that. Uh, it means that they were wealthy. There were at one time 12 different major pagan temples in Corinth. One of those temples was the Temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And the Temple of Aphrodite practiced uh, ceremonial prostitution. It was considered an act of worship to the goddess Aphrodite if you had sex with a temple prostitute. At one point, there were, it's estimated, a thousand temple prostitutes from the Temple of Aphrodite wandering the streets of, of Corinth, encouraging men to worship, so to speak. Okay. But they also had a major temple to Apollo and others. The problem was, here you have a major seaport, very wealthy, a lot of money thrown around, 12 pagan temples, one of the largest ones, practicing prostitution. The city of Corinth, became a lot of sailors in town. Anybody been a sailor? Anybody been in the Navy? Okay, but you know what it means when you have a lot of sailors in town, right? Um, it became, Corinth became known for immorality. In fact, a, they, to, one of the expressions in those days, to Corinthianize, meant to do something immoral. When, whenever a Greek play was written, if there was a character in there that was supposed to be from Corinth, they were always either a prostitute or a drunkard, because Corinth was known for immorality, um, and rightly so. A lot of money, a lot of foreigners, people coming in and out all the time, you know, it's like a major convention center kind of environment. And so morality was a big problem for these people. Um, that's where Paul planted the church, okay? It's one of the places. Now, why did he do that? Because again, this was the largest city, the most important city in all of Greece. The fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. He'd already been to Antioch. 
He didn't go to Alexandria, but Apollo had come from there. There was a church already there. And so Corinth was an, an obvious place for him to go to spread the gospel, especially because so many people going in and out, traveling through, to have a strong church there witnessing to people would be you know, a, 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 an important way to provide the message of the gospel to as many people as possible, right? Okay. So, these are pictures that I took from the city of Corinth. This is what remains of the Temple of Apollo, which is right in the middle of town. One of the things that, the, and these, this is probably 35 or 40 feet tall, okay? One of the things I, I pointed out when we studied Corinthians in Bible class is, an example of the wealth is the fact that these are monoliths. You know what that means? This is one piece of stone. Can you imagine the relative cost of cutting one piece of stone like that, transporting it to the site, and setting it upright compared to the way it was usually done? In my house, I've got pillars like this tall made of, out of Cantera, and they're like three pieces. Can you imagine doing that with something this big around, 35 or 40 feet tall, one piece? That took a lot of money, took a lot of wealth to be able to do that. But it was a sign of their wealth that they had temples like that, and a dozen of them. Um, this is a major spring. This, if you have a study Bible or if you looked at some of the diagrams of what Corinth was like, this was the Pyrene uh, spring where people would go for water. This is looking from one of the markets across the Temple of Apollo, which is that, up to the, the um, Agro Corinth, it's called. On top of this hill is a fortress. That's also where the Temple of Aphrodite was, but the prostitutes would come down and wander through the streets. You know, to, to solicit customers. But it had this major fortress up there, which is another reason why it was a very a powerful city, is it had fortifications as well. If necessary, people could retreat back there, although they really didn't have to because their location, they were fairly, fairly secure. So um, these are still the ruins that exist today. The things that you read about in the book of Acts. Acts 18 is where you read about Paul's longest visit to the city of Corinth. And some of the things, like he, he is brought on charges by the Jewish people to the local governor, Gallio, who was the brother of the philosopher Seneca. And Gallio um, refuses to hear the accusations because he says, These, this Christianity is just a sect of Judaism. You guys are arguing amongst yourselves. I am not going to be the one to make decisions between you people about your own religion. So you sort it out. And... That, that occurred on what was called the Bema. The Bema was like the judgment seat that was part of the Agora, the big marketplace area. Well, that Bema is still there today. So if you go to Corinth, you can visit that. Um, the, there is no church, in fact, throughout all of Turkey now. Uh, and the, those parts of the original churches that existed even in those parts of Greece, they don't exist anymore. You, know, you can see ruins of them, but the churches themselves are not there. And for the most part, the cities aren't. There's a smaller town that's now next door to this, but the city of Corinth itself does not exist anymore. Um, but you can kind of get a picture of it. And you read again in the book of Acts, we have all of the accounts, the historical accounts, of where Paul went and what his involvement was, etc. We match that up with the writing of his letters, and we can have a chronology and we can understand the events that were happening there. Happening there. In fact, in that account in Acts, when Paul is accused by the Jews, and Gallio, the local governor, refuses to hear the charges, the Jews respond by turning and beating up a man named Sosthenes. And Gallio refuses to step in. He doesn't do anything. And so Sosthenes gets a royal beating. If you look at the, the first verses of 1 Corinthians, it says, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, bring you greeting along with Sosthenes. We believe that's the same Sosthenes who's now traveling with Paul, perhaps as his secretary, who is recorded as having been beaten by the Jews in the book of Acts. Because Sosthenes, we're told in Acts, had been the head of the local synagogue, the Jewish synagogue. He had converted to Christianity. And so when the Jews try to bring charges against Paul for spreading Christianity, and they, the governor refuses to hear the charges, they turn and beat up Sosthenes, who used to be their leader, and now has converted to Christianity. So they give him a beating, and then Sosthenes ends up traveling with Paul. It's probable that Sosthenes' name is included in there because he would have still have been seen as a leader of the church in Corinth, the Christians in Corinth, since he was a converted Jew who had been a man of some importance 
as the head of the synagogue. And by including his name in there, it sort of adds additional credibility to Paul, saying, you know, Sosthenes is with me. He's involved in sending you this greeting, which means one of their former leaders was completely in agreement with, with what Paul was telling them. Okay? So looking at those things in parallel, Paul's letters, as well as the book of Acts, we get a much more complete picture. Any questions about any of that? Yes, Lynn. Lynn first. It's slightly off topic, but uh, does Phoenicia exist at this time? Phoenicia? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, in fact... Where is Phoenicia? Uh, you know, you read in the... Phoenicia is north of Israel. Uh, the cities of Tyre and Sidon. Technically, there is no Phoenicia. They were city-states. Tyre and Sidon were city-states that, the, for the sake of convenience, when they were talking about them, they called them Phoenicia. Um, they were maritime peoples. Um, what a lot of people don't know is the people of Tyre, because they were maritime people, they were sailors, they were traders, they settled in other communities around the world. And one of the most important uh, settled settlements they had was in North Africa. It was the city of Carthage. And Carthage became a primary enemy, you know, almost defeated Rome. The only way Rome ended up not being defeated by Carthage is that when Hannibal showed up with his elephants and, and warriors, uh, the Romans refused to do battle. They kept running from him, and so Hannibal ended up spending several years chasing them around the, you know, the Italian peninsula without even being able to fight, and finally had to go home. But those were the Phoenicians originally. The Carthaginians had been Phoenicians, Tyrians especially, from Tyre. But that has nothing to do with this. No, but we had these great military, or uh, marine people at that time. Like they're still known as great right. mariners. Um, and if you visit that area, they talk about mm -hmm. the Phoenicians, and I just could never get a picture. So we have Carthage still being a very prominent a city area. Not by this point. Carthage had been destroyed. Carthage was destroyed by Rome in the First Punic War. Right. Okay. After, well, it actually was destroyed in the like Second or Third Punic War. You know, um, didn't get destroyed until after you know after Hannibal was, was gone. Um, but. Yeah, Rome finally destroyed them. In fact, uh, very famously, you know, that Rome was chanting, Carthage must be destroyed. Anything else they said, they always ended it with, Carthage must be destroyed. And eventually Carthage was, and they salted the land. So, so what happened to Corinth? Was it flat Corinth out? doesn't have anything to do with Carthage. Corinth well, doesn't no, have any... But we're feet. talking about Corinth, and I'm trying to get some image in my brain of what's happened to these great city-states or great nations. And so I say... What happened to Corinth at this great location and this great economy? Right. Well, Corinth, Ephesus also. Ephesus probably the major city on the, the west coast of uh, Asia Minor. Um, several things happened. One, their economies eventually declined. In the case of Ephesus, they were a port city, and their port silted up, and they couldn't, they couldn't, were, they were unsuccessful trying to, um, to empty out their harbor, and the harbor ended up being so far away from, from the city uh, the actual water from the city, that it ended up not being viable anymore. Plus, they were attacked by invading armies. Um, I'm not sure what all the destruction of Corinth was, but for much of it, the other armies coming in. You know, as long as Rome was in control, they maintained those cities. When other military forces started coming invading, then cities like Corinth frequently were destroyed because they'd been centers of <coughs> Roman influence. Okay? I don't know. I don't know that as an exact thing, but that's you know. In some cases, it was natural disasters. In some cases, it was things like it wasn't viable economically anymore, like in the case of Ephesus. In some cases, it was just military conquest. You know, yeah. Barbara. Well, maybe it's just a matter of logistics. I don't know. But uh, the people, the Christians in Corinth, were they two hundred fifty thousand people? That's a pretty good sized city, mm -hmm. no matter what. Were they kind of scattered around through the whole city? Well, the they, people. In terms, of where they, in terms of where they lived, probably. Now, we do know that while Corinth was a wealthy city, a lot of very prosperous, you know, high-end people, not many of those people were part of the church. We know that because Paul says, not many of you, speaking to Cor the Corinthians, uh, the Corinthian church, not many of you were wealthy or of significance or of influence. Meaning, most of the Christians probably were from lower class, either slaves or lower income kind of people. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, Sosthenes would have been influential because the only way you got to be the head of the uh, synagogue would have been if you were a person of wealth and influence. Um, we also know that Erastus, who was the head of public works, 
uh, became a Christian. And today, I don't have that picture here, but I have a, a picture of it. Um, there is a, Erastus was the governor, of, the manager of public works and very influential. He became a Christian. And today, there is a stone that has carved out on it, you know, a gift of Erastus in, in uh, Greek, which means he, you know, he provided the funds for that road. Um, so there were a few people of significance. Most, most of them were lower income, which means the only thing that would have divided them up would have been, you know, in those days you had richer parts of towns and poorer parts of town, and most of the Christians probably lived in the poorer parts of town. But just like us, they gathered for church. Um, and well, that, that answered my question. I thought I would say, now his letter comes to Corinth, right. Paul. And how, how do the, the, all the Christians, how do they all hear about this letter? Yeah, well, they, they would have all come together and had a ready. They all come together then in one yeah. place. Yeah, they were a church in the same way we have churches today. Okay. Uh -huh. They would gather for worship. In fact, that's one of the problems is when they gathered for worship, they were conducting themselves in a way that was, that was pretty awful. And that's one of the things that Paul is correcting them about. When they gather for, you know, for the, the Lord's Supper, which would have involved communion, but also a meal, sort of like our second Sunday, um, there were people who were being greedy, who were taking more than their share, who were getting, you know, gorging themselves and getting drunk when somebody else didn't have enough. And Paul is correcting them on all of that. But that's, that's a clear evidence. They gathered together for worship, for uh, meals, for events. And the letter would be read to them. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, anything else? Just, um, I, I really love this technology. And there's this program called Google Earth. Mm -hmm. And you can go to Google Earth in this isthmus, right? You can still see the. They got pictures of a portion of the road, but that's all. That's become a canal. They have a canal now. It's a huge canal, but entering into the canal, there's still some of the rocks of the original road. Okay. There. It's just a fascinating, fascinating. If you go there today, if you travel from Athens, which is where almost anything you do is once you start in Athens. Um, if you travel to Corinth, you cross a bridge over the Corinthian Canal uh, before you actually get to the old city of Corinth. Um, and this canal, it's not doesn't have any locks. It's it's sea level that connects the Ionian Sea and the uh, the Saronic Gulf of the Adriatic Sea. And from the bridge, it's like 400 feet down. But the actual canal, which is, was a, an extraordinary feat of engineering when they did it, um, it's not very wide. You know, it's not, it's not ocean liner wide. It's like I was on a sailing boat and there were only like 10 feet on either side of it. Um, so it's very narrow, very deep, but they cut out all of that rock and created, and it's along the approximate path of where the road used to be. So it's three and a half miles long. It's a three and a half mile wide distance. Um, so it's fascinating stuff, but invariably, if you go from Athens to Corinth, you know, they'll, whoever it is is taking you, if it's a tour or whatever, they'll stop, you know, and they don't give shops there and everything, and you walk out on the bridge and look down, and you can, and you can see the boats traveling through this thing. That's where the old road used to be, okay? All right. The uh, Erastus <laughs> stone is in page one, 291. Okay, 291 of your book. Yeah. I have my own photograph of that, but that's the, you know, that's Erastus, um, Minister of Public Works in, in Ephesus, who was a Christian, and is referred to um, in the Book of Acts by name, okay? All right. Any other questions about Corinth, the city, culture, any of that kind of stuff? And again, you really need to go back and, and be reading the Book of Acts also to be getting the historical context for all of these events happening. So Acts 18 is the primary place where his, his long visit in Corinth is taking place and you have the you know the accusations to Gallio and the beating of Sosthenes and you know all of that kind of stuff. Alright? But let's look at the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, actually you know what? I've got about 12 minutes till. Before I get into this, let's go ahead and take a break right now and then we'll come back and we'll do 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians all together. Okay? So take a break. The book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, author Apostle Paul. Now, it seems obvious, but there are a number of Paul's letters that are questioned, as I told you last week. People, more modern or liberal scholars, might have a tendency to question 2 Thessalonians and the pastoral epistles and some others. Nobody really questions Romans that we looked at last week or 1 and 2 Corinthians as being written by the Apostle Paul. So that's not, there's no challenge to that. We believe that the date was A.D. 55 to 57. Remember I told you that Paul was in Ephesus 
for two and a half years or so, two and a half to three years. We believe that his first letter, which, you know, the warning letter, and his second letter, which is this one, 1 Corinthians, were both written during his time at Ephesus, where he went after he had been in Corinth, because he was getting reports of things going wrong in Corinth. So he wrote from Ephesus when he was in ministry there. The theme of the, of the book is problems in Christian conduct in the Corinthian church, including uh, immaturity, divisions, jealousy, immorality, false teaching. You know, we could add to that list. Uh, there were a lot of things going wrong. The purpose is to promote greater maturity in the church in one of Greece's major cities. Actually, it was, it, that's not accurate. It, is, it was Greece's major city. Corinth, by a wide margin, was the most significant city in all of Greece. Um, one way we can break it down is to think in terms of three sections. An answer to the report of divisions, which means he got the reports that there were divisions in the body for, in various ways. Then, answer to report of fornication, there, were, there was immorality going on, particularly a man sleeping with his stepmother. Uh, we assume it's his stepmother, not his mother, because it's described as his father's wife. Um, and apparently the church didn't have a problem with that. <laughs> and so Paul is calling them to serious tasks because of that. And then he gets into other issues related to it. And then an answer to letter of questions. The indication is, because of a, the, Paul goes through a whole series of explanations, theological explanations and, and pastoral responses, and it, it, there appears to have been a letter sent to him, or brought to him, that had a number of questions that the church had. How are we to do this? How are we to respond to that? What, what should we think about this? And so Paul responds to a number of those things. Um, that's one way to look at the particulars of, of this letter. Let's actually go to an outline of 1 Corinthians and talk about the, the specifics. In his introduction, Paul identifies himself. He identifies Sosthenes, which again, we believe is probably the same Sosthenes that in Acts, we're told, got beaten up by the Jewish people in their frustration over Gallio, the governor, not hearing their accusations against Paul. And <clears throat> probably it, uh, they include Sosthenes not only because he's traveling with Paul, because Paul had other people working with him, but because the people in Corinth would have known Sosthenes, and he would have been a leader when he was there, having been the head of the synagogue. So his name adds kind of one more testimony that Sosthenes is with me, he sends his greetings too. In other words, Sosthenes is involved in writing this letter, he agrees with everything I'm telling you. It's kind of the implication. Um, then Paul jumps in right away to a discussion of the divisions that have occurred in the Corinthian church. Um, first, he just he, he says, I'm getting reports that this happened. And there's several different reports that he got. He received word from the household of Chloe. He had received a, a separate letter. And then three of the men, who had apparently been prominent leaders in the Corinthian church, came to visit him. Uh, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and uh, Icaeus, I think his name is. The three of them came and reported. And so Paul is saying, I'm getting multiple reports here that you guys are really having these problems. You know, so it's not like this is a question anymore. And then he goes into the cause of the division. First, that they have misunderstood or have a wrong conception of what the Christian message is about. That this is, this is a much more comprehensive thing. This is not just kind of a philosophy that we deal with on the side and then we continue to live the way most of the people in Corinth live. Immorally, you know, with, with a focus on all the wrong stuff. Then a wrong conception of Christian ministry and ministers. You know, what is it that is supposed to be? One of the things that we are, that there's an indication that people were divided on who they wanted to be their, their pastor, their minister. And there, was, there were fights occurring about that. And so Paul is trying to clarify that this is not a political competition, basically. This is not something that should be tearing the church apart. If, if you guys are struggling in that kind of way, you know, and he says, some say I'm a follower of Paul, some of Apollo, some of Cephas, which is Peter. Uh, others a follower of Christ. And Paul says, did, you know, did Apollo save you? you know? and did Paul, was I responsible for you, you know, coming to the faith? Um, other than teaching it to you, no. We are all followers of Jesus Christ. What is your problem? And then he gets into a wrong con uh, conception of Paul's ministry. Something that comes up here, and again especially, toward the end of 2 Corinthians, is 
that some, uh, in 2 Corinthians we have the clear indication, Paul talks about that super teachers, he calls them, have arrived in Corinth and are teaching against Paul and Paul's message. The indication is probably that they were Gnostic in their orientation. Gnosticism was especially dominant in the second century in this part of the world, but there were aspects of early Gnosticism even then that they believed they were the recipients of special knowledge. The word gnosis in Greek means knowledge. And so therefore, they were special. They were super teachers. And they had the ability to communicate this special knowledge to people. But in the process of trying to win people to their side, these false teachers were discrediting, trying to discredit Paul. They would say, you know, you can't listen to Paul. He's not really an apostle. He doesn't have any authority. Yeah, he writes really big, you know, like great letters, but when you meet him in person, he's, he's a pipsqueak, he doesn't speak very well, you know, why would anybody want to follow him, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they were really down, you know, downplaying Paul. And so Paul starts here advocating a clearer understanding of what his ministry is, and in various places he talks about himself as their spiritual father, that he was the one God had called to be an apostle, and he makes that very clear, by special appointment. Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. He did experience the risen Christ, and then was trained by Christ in special through, he talks about special visions, you know, uh, but that he is deserving of the title of apostle. He was their spiritual father, and they need to listen to him and not those false teachers. In fact, he has a long litany in 2 Corinthians where he talks about, um, um, okay, if I have to, let me boast about myself. And he says, in parentheses, he says, I'm being foolish here, but you forced me to it. And so he gets into very blunt terms about what his credentials are and why he has reason to be listened to and believed and trusted as their spiritual leader, as an apostle, as a special appointee by God. Um, then he gets to an exhortation to end the various divisions. You know, why are you guys fighting amongst yourselves? This needs to stop. This is not what it means to be the body of Christ. Then he gets into the second section, the moral and ethical disorders in the church. First, he addresses the fact that they seem to have fallen into the same kind of way of living as all of the rest of Corinth was prone to. Again, immoral, drunken, orgies, you know, temple prostitution, all of that kind of lifestyle that was so common in the city of Corinth. The church has been called to something other than that, but they've begun to fall into all of that again. He, he accuses them of uh, having lawsuits, oppressing lawsuits against other Christians in the public court system. And Paul says, is there no one amongst you that is wise enough to, to determine disagreements among yourselves? You have to go to a secular judge and file a lawsuit? That, you should not be doing that. That's not appropriate. And then he gets into warnings against uh, sexual immorality. And that's where he addresses, addresses the fact that I'm told one of your number <clears throat> is in a sexual relationship with his, his uh, father's wife, and the rest of you approve of that. In fact, you seem to be proud of it. I don't know exactly in what context they can seem to be proud of that, but that's what Paul says. And he says... Absolutely, you guys need to be disciplined. You, you need to deal with this. Now, an interesting thing here, and Paul is indicating, is suggesting here, that you all are quick to criticize sexual immorality outside the church, and you won't deal with it when it's inside the church. Folks, that's exactly a problem the church has today. We're always quick to shake our finger at somebody who's not a Christian <coughs> saying, oh, those horrible people. Paul says... When I tell you not to associate with somebody who's sexually immoral, I'm not talking about don't associate with somebody that's not a Christian. If they are in the world, the only way you can do that is if you remove yourself completely from the world, which is not appropriate to do. In other words, the standards that we hold for other believers is not the same as the standards we hold for somebody who's not a believer. He is very clear about that, <coughs> that we are not to sit in judgment for somebody who's not a believer, how can we expect anything different from them? Doesn't mean we say it's okay, but we don't, you know, we don't put ourselves in a position of judging them negatively outside the body. But inside the body, we have a responsibility to hold each other accountable. And especially those in leadership in the church have that responsibility. And yet we don't. Okay? Um, 
And Paul is very clear about that. This is one of the things that the church very conveniently has chosen to forget over the last 2,000 years. That we hold ourselves to a higher standard than we're expected to, uh, that, than we should expect from the world. Okay? Then he goes on into the question of marriage. Here's where he begins to address things that apparently have been raised to him in, le in a letter. First, the issue of marriage. And Paul here says, if somebody's betrothed to be married, it's just fine for them to get married. If they're not betrothed to be married, my advice, and he says, advice, is that it's better if you stay single. And the reason is because Paul expected the Lord to return at any moment. All right? God had not given Paul a revelation that it was going to be a long period of time. Most of the apostles and disciples in the first century thought that Jesus' return was imminent, that he was going to come back by Tuesday. Paul was one of those people. And so what Paul says here is, my advice to you is that unless you really are burning with passionate desire, rather than fall into sin, then get married. But, and here we talk about the, um, oops, the general principles, then the problems of the married and the problems of the unmarried. The problems of the married are, he says, that if you're married, then you have a responsibility to be concerned about the needs and interests of your spouse. And that takes up a big part of your energy and time. If you are not, if it's not necessary for you to be married, if you don't really feel the pressure to be married, then it's better to stay single because you can focus more of your energy on the return of the Lord and His ministry until He returns, which Paul believed would be very soon. But, he says the problem with the unmarried is that if you have passion, passionate desires and you can't control yourself, better to be married and have a legitimate godly outlet for that than to sin. And again, in the context of Corinth, where everybody was doing that kind of thing, you know, Paul is setting a standard that most of that culture would not have understood. Yes, Flora. Then why in the beginning that God said it's not good for man to be alone? Well, again, and Paul, Paul would absolutely agree with that. Paul is not disagreeing with that point. Paul is saying the Lord is going to come back any minute, any day. So Paul did not feel like he was telling somebody, you need to be alone for the rest of your life. He was saying, the Lord is, he thought, the Lord is going to come back right away. So unless you have a desperate need to be married, it's better for you to focus on the things of the Lord until he comes back. He, I don't, Paul did not have a sense that he was telling people, okay, if you're 30 years old and you're probably going to live until you're 75, then you should be single for the next 45 years. That was not what Paul was saying. He was saying, in the next year or two years or three years at the most, I expect the Lord, and he didn't use those numbers, but the implication is, I expect the Lord is coming back. Do everything you can to focus on the things of the Lord and spreading the message before his return. And the best way to be able to do that is by not having yourself having to be occupied with the needs of a spouse. Yeah. Wasn't Paul married at one time? No. We have no indication of that. But, uh, to be a Pharisee, I thought you had to... Be you didn't have to be. Now, it is true that as a young man, as a Pharisee, the strong likelihood would have been that he would have been married. But we have no record of him having been married. If he was married and his wife died, we don't know that. We do know that from the time he does appear on the scene, he's he's not married. He's single. So, um, but but we don't know that. But it wasn't part of. So you're saying that a Pharisee did not have to. Be it was not required. It was just sort of socially the norm, but it was not required. There was nothing that said you had to be married. Now, and in fact, Paul says in here when he's talking about being married, he says there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, he says Cephas and some of the other brothers take their wives with them. A ministry. Peter was married and his wife traveled with him, based upon what Paul says here, traveled with him on his mission trips. So Peter's wife was going along with him. And Paul tells that in, by way of saying, I am not telling you it's, it's wrong to get married. I'm just saying, if you don't get married, you'll have more time and energy and focus to focus on the things of the Lord because I think he's coming back pretty quick. Okay? You see the difference? He does not say being married is bad. He just says... Being able to concentrate more of your focus on the things of the Lord until he returns is better. Okay? Um, he actually honors marriage. Again, he says, Peter and the others, there's nothing wrong with it. And they travel with their wives. Right? Um, 
He goes on in answering questions from this, this letter that we don't have, but we, you know, we, we only hear the response side of it, dealing with questionable practices, especially with regard to food sacrifice to idols and other things of that sort. And Paul talks about the fact, the principle, in, in those days, again, 12 pagan temples in Corinth. They would sacrifice, let's say, um, a bull to, in the temple of Apollo. Well, amazingly, Apollo didn't actually take the bull and eat it. So after that, and they would take the bull to the meat market, which is right next door. In fact, the picture that I had, where, which you saw, the looked like stalls, and the temple of Apollo was in the medium distance, and then the Acre of Corinth was in the far distance. That was the meat market. So it was that close to the Temple of Apollo and some of the other temples. They would take the meat that's been sacrificed in the temples to the idol, uh, to the pagan gods, and they would then take it, butcher it, and sell it. And people knew that. Some of them were of the opinion that eating food that has been sacrificed, meat especially, that's been sacrificed to idols, was a sin because you were in some way participating with that idol activity. Others said, it's a piece of meat. And that God isn't a real God anyway. So I don't have a problem with this. Paul gets into this and he says the principle is not that this was sacrificed to Apollo, big deal. But the principle is if you eating that meat is witnessed by someone who does have a problem with it and that becomes a problem for them, then you shouldn't do it. This is where we get into, this is where he starts talking about the fact that appearance should not be offensive. You should not do things that will offend, not because they are inherently wrong, but because we don't want to provide offense to people, because if we do, we compromise our ability to share with them about Jesus. Doesn't mean that we're always on pins and needles afraid we're going to offend somebody. So, you know, the gospel of Christ is an offense. But don't offend people over what you're eating, or whether or not you have your hair covered, or whether or not you, you know, a woman shaves all of her hair off. Those things cause offense and create problems when they don't, and they don't accomplish anything. For it. Well, Jesus did all the things that he's telling everybody else not to do. Not to offend. Yeah. Jesus did all the things that he's telling everybody else not to do. Not to offend. Jesus ate. Uh, he had prostitutes around him. He had. Uh, he ate with tax collectors. He did all of these things. <clears throat> right. It seems to me that Paul is all about law again. No, he's not. And well, it why? Up. Why did Jesus do those things? To bring others in. No, the reason Jesus did those things is to prove to people that those were not necessary for righteousness. Jesus healed on the Sabbath because he said, you know, you're, calling, you're saying this is wrong because you think healing is works. Well, what's more important? Healing somebody or following this? And he says, you people go out and if your bull falls in a ditch on, on the Sabbath, you'll pull him out. And you, you tell me I shouldn't heal? The reason Jesus violated those aspects of the law was because he was making the point that you don't get saved. You're not made right with God by obeying these small laws. Okay? Paul is saying the same thing. Paul says exactly the same thing. He says it doesn't matter whether you eat food sacrificed to idols. That does not make you righteous. But don't offend somebody who sees you doing something because if you do, then they're not going to be open to your testimony of the gospel. If you're known to be a Christian and you do something that is offensive, just outright offensive to somebody else, and you know in advance it's going to be offensive and you do it anyway, you are actually damaging the testimony of the gospel. Paul and Jesus are not saying opposite things here. They're saying the same thing. And that is that, as Paul says, um, you know, all things are, I'm free to do all things, but not all things are beneficial. And so he's saying... Don't do things that are going to be offensive, not because they're wrong, but because it's not productive, it's not useful in terms of your witness. John? I was just going to add, um, it seems to me that the, the, the contention that Paul is making here is that when you allow your liberty to be more important than the welfare of your brother, then you're no longer walking in love. That's a and I'd wonderful like way just, of saying it. I'd like to take just a minute and just read this. Because this, this might terrify that up. This is from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, verse 9. But take care of this right of yours, 
does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge or your freedom, this weak person is destroyed the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. And here's the here's plot. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Right. So the issue is, is we are made free in Christ. And that freedom requires uh, administration. It, it requires a stewardship. For the sake of others. Yeah, in all things. But there are certain things that I will not do uh, because it would cause my brother to stumble. And you see this so clearly living in another culture. Not just within your own culture, but living in another culture. And, and again, you know, uh, Paul and Jesus are exactly saying the same thing here. That I, my salvation, my righteousness before the Lord is not affected by eating food sacrificed to idols. But I'm not going to do something that is going to offend them away. Jesus made a point of those things because he was trying to break the law, you know, to, to break the power of the law. Paul has already done that, you know. Becky first and then here. Um, was he meaning to offend the brothers in the church or the ones that don't know the gospel? I mean, he, means, he means somebody who's not a Christian. Basically, exactly. if they see a Christian and they know he's a Christian and he says he's eating food sacrificed to Apollo, then it's going to mess up their whole understanding if that's a, if that's an issue for them uh, of what it means to be a Christian. So did, did, Christian wait, did you say that he was doing that to non-Christians? Oh, because he's clearly he's, he's talking about brothers. Too. Well, no, but he's telling the brothers don't do that for the sake of non-believers. I think. Well, maybe and, and no, if, he's probably both. Or weak brothers. Probably, and weak yeah. brothers who might have trouble with it. Yeah, he'd be saying the same thing. Don't do something that they're going to be be messed up over either. Finish Becky and then here. Um, so if the if the Christians were going out and doing like Jesus did with the um, meeting up, okay, say someone wants to help the prostitutes or whatever, and, and you're and you're, you know you're down there with them, they expect their brothers to understand why they're doing it, right? Yeah, it, that's it's not quite the same thing because Paul's saying that we've talked about this uh, in in church in Bible study. There are some things that um, I have to cross over social boundaries in order to minister. And I'll be real clear about that. If I'm going to do that, I want to make sure, as a pastor or an elder or whatever, that other people are aware of that or supportive of that. And I've got backup, if you will. But there are some things that I would not do. For instance, um, and, and I used an example. Um, I am not going to go and hang out in a pornographic bookshop to witness, in, to witness. To the word, the word, yeah. because there's all sorts of dangers for me. There's also, you know, the, the, the likelihood of that being a productive ministry kind of situation compared to the potential for people to perceive it negatively. The example we use is, um, is drinking wine or drinking beer. There is nothing in Scripture that says that it is wrong to drink. It, there's plenty of Scripture that says it's wrong to drink to excess. So being drunken is wrong. But you know what? We're going to talk about this in systematic theology. Anytime we add to Scripture and say it's a sin if you drink wine, ever, any amount. It's a sin if you go to a movie. It's a sin if you dance. It's a sin to say those things. Because we are adding admonitions, laws. You can put your hand down. I'll call you in a minute. Okay. Uh, you're looking tired. Yes. Um, uh, uh, when, whenever, whenever we add stuff like that, we are in the wrong because we are presuming that the standards that we prefer have the same weight as what Scripture actually says. Those things are not in the Bible. Okay, It never says, don't preach. And yet, I was saved in a Baptist church. And they went through the wildest gyrations to try to come up with a reason why it was wrong to ever drink. Well, Jesus only drank new wine. It was unfermented. That's crazy. <laughs> that's that's dishonest is what it is. Okay, go to either. So, so yeah, we have to be careful that what we do, you know, that we got that, that there really is a ministry purpose to it. There's not there's not greater danger than there is benefit. 
But Jesus was intentionally trying to break the idea that the law was what made you righteous, which was the thing he was struggling against. Paul has already broken that in his life, and he's just simply saying, I'm free to do anything, pretty much. But I'm not going to do anything if it's going to in some way harm my brother, because that's not love. In fact, right in the middle of this section, you know, about what he gets later about exercising the gifts, is the love chapter of the Bible. And his whole point is, all of this stuff needs to be driven not by, I'm going to prove my liberty, I can do whatever I want, you know, but instead, how do we reflect that in love to our brothers and sisters? Okay, now, Ken. Paul is talking to weak conscience, about, about weak conscience people who aren't really sure of what's right and wrong. He is not talking to Pharisees. Right. And, and we have our own set of religious Pharisees who have written all kinds of laws where the, where the Bible didn't write any laws. He's not talking about those people. Right. He's talking about honest people who are just searching and, and are weak and don't know. Yeah. Or and maybe they do know and they're breaking the rules anyway. I mean, right. because they want to. That feels good. Yeah. So, you know, it's a good point that Jesus is dealing with people on one end of the legalistic spectrum, the Pharisees. Paul is dealing with people on the other end of the spectrum who pretty much think, you know, anything goes because that's the culture they're in. Most of the Christians in Corinth would have been Gentiles. Not all. You know, some of the, his early converts were Jewish. But then when the synagogue created such problems, he stopped preaching in the synagogue and started preaching in the marketplace. And so the, the, the majority of the people in the church in Corinth would have been Gentiles. And so... Again, he's preaching to people on the opposite end of the moral spectrum from the Pharisees. And his point is, you know, they're so quick to want to go there anyway, don't give them an excuse by doing something that they're going to interpret as being a license to take liberty, either with foreign gods or with you know, immorality or anything else. Okay? All right, so he, um, he applies those principles. Then he gets into issues of public worship. Again, we're in the section here still where Paul is responding to questions that have been asked. First, he talks about propriety in worship and says, you people don't seem to understand what it means to worship. And he gets immediately into a discussion of the Lord's Supper. And he calls it that, and he says, when you come together for the Lord's Supper, I'm told that some of you are taking all this food and being a glutton and drinking until you're drunk, <coughs> And other people come and they don't have anything. And they're hungry. They literally don't have enough to eat. And you're, as part of what's supposed to be a, an act of worship, of celebration of the body, you're being a glutton and a drunkard. What is wrong with you people? You know, and Paul is straightening them out on that. He then gets into the practice of the spiritual gifts, which again, they apparently had, while... Um, we can assume from the way Paul addresses it, they really did have experience of the spiritual gifts. They were imbalanced in the practice of those things. Um, he talks about the, the practicing of those gifts, that it's supposed to be done orderly, it's supposed to be done in a way that is part of worship, and this is the place where Paul talks about speaking in tongues, and he says, you know, if, if you have the gift of tongues, but you don't have the gift of interpretation, or somebody else doesn't have the gift of interpretation, then do it at home. Do not do it in public worship. Because the purpose of public worship is not for somebody else to hear you speaking in a language that you or nobody else can understand. He is very practical about that. And he says, worship is the time where the body together, and he gives specific instructions. He says if there is a word of prophecy, two or perhaps three should give a prophetic word. Um, you know, the, and, and he gives it very practical instructions on how they're supposed to be practicing the spiritual gifts in an attitude of worship. Always with the premise, the principle here is, this is supposed to be worship to God for the benefit of the body as it comes before God. It's not all about you and you getting to show off with whatever your spiritual gift is. And there may be a little tinge in there of Paul suggesting that not all of this was legitimate. Maybe they were showing off from their own. No efforts, not because it was a gift of the Spirit. Um, he doesn't say that. I'm, I'm extrapolating from what he says. And he does give them very specific rules to govern how they're supposed to do worship. Okay. He then goes on regarding, there have been questions apparently about the resurrection. 
And he talks about the certainty of the resurrection. Some people, and this is where he gets into the, you know, some of you are questioning whether the resurrection uh, is real, whether it's going to happen. Um, well, if it's not real, then why are some of you baptizing yourselves for the dead? If you don't believe there's any resurrection, those people are dead. They're dead, dead. Okay? Um, but not because he's suggesting that that's a right thing. He's just using that as an example. He's heard they've been doing this thing. And he talks about the certainty that if, if we are not sure of the resurrection, then we are to be pitied above all people. Because if we are not sure of the resurrection, uh, of, that we are to be resurrected, then we have no faith in the resurrection of Christ. And we have, our faith is built on nothing. We're lost. The resurrection is a critical theology. It's a critical belief to the Christian faith. And Paul makes that very clear here. Both that Jesus was physically resurrected from the dead and that we have the hope of the resurrection. Okay? Um, and concluding appeal. Then he gets into practical and personal matters and he mentions here, amongst his practical things, that he's, going, he's collecting money for the church in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was undergoing a severe famine at that point. And the original church in Jerusalem, the, the mother church, was suffering terribly. Remember, most of the early believers were people of lower income. They were either slaves or poor Jewish people, and they didn't have a lot of resources. When famine strikes, those are the first people that suffer. And because the church in Jerusalem was in such terrible straits, Paul was traveling around collecting money to take back there. And he mentions it here as a very practical thing, and then he gives a personal, you know, an expression of love and a personal closing to them. Um, he gets to much more specifics about that collection for the church in Jerusalem in the second book. Okay. So this is 1 Corinthians. Any questions about that? I think 1 and 2 Corinthians, especially 1 Corinthians, is one of the most important books for us today. Because we live in a time when the church is doing some of the same stupid things that the church in Corinth did. You know, we, we excuse immorality. We excuse, you know, we will look past anything for our, in ourselves and always be trying to point the finger and make accusations against somebody who's not even part of the faith. Um, you know, we'll, we're quick to want to condemn somebody who told a lie, but 30% of our congregations are divorced. And Jesus had a lot more to say about divorce than he did about most of the other moral issues that Christians get in trouble with. And I'm not saying there's never a reason for divorce. But we ought to take it a heck of a lot more seriously than we do. And yet most of us, we just slide right over that one. When this is something Jesus talked quite a bit about. Okay. As an example, again, there are reasons why sometimes divorce is necessary. I'm not condemning everybody that gets divorced. But it's just one little piece of the fact that we... G.K. Chesterton said that people don't often disagree on um, what is wrong. But they often do disagree on which wrongs are acceptable. <laughs> well, that's what the Corinthian church was doing. They were saying, well, it's okay that this guy's sleeping with his stepmother. Because we like him. He's an elder, or whatever it was. We don't know. We do the same kind of stuff. And so, the 1 Corinthians especially, I believe, is very important for us as a church today. Paul is pointing, you know, he's talking to us. That's the reason this has come down to us 2,000 years later. Okay. Any other questions or comments about 1 Corinthians? We'll deal with 2 Corinthians. Okay. 2 Corinthians, same author, Apostle Paul. Again, nobody questions that. Nobody with any sense questions that. There's always somebody who questions something. Uh, but even the most liberal scholars will agree that 1 and 2 Corinthians are written by Paul. Same dates. We believe that sometime in that period, 55 to 57, when Paul was in <laughs> Ephesus, he wrote this letter, and then later on, you know, when he left Ephesus, was traveling um, up to Macedonia, that's where he wrote 2 Corinthians. But it was in the same general time period, in about that three-year range. We put the circa in there, the C always means about, or as best we know. Uh, probably it would have been toward the end of that three-year period, 55 to 57, when he was traveling Macedonia. Um, it again is his, Paul's defense and his explanation more of his apostleship than anything else. Um, 
The purpose, to defend his ministry and message, admonish false teachers, admonish the Corinthians to clean up their act and to give as promised to the poor church in Jerusalem. Now again, this book, 2 Corinthians, starts out on a much more positive note. Um, it's, the, the indication is he has gotten a good report from Titus. They received his uh, very severe letter after the 1 Corinthian letter that we have, 1 Corinthians. Um, and responded in terms of doing better. Then we get to chapter 10, and he gets harsh again. So either, as I said, he received a report somewhere while he was writing this letter in Macedonia that there at least was a faction of the church that was still getting it wrong and still being very negative about Paul and following false teachers and questioning Paul's apostleship and his, his authority and leadership. Or else, less likely, I believe, that the last four chapters, 10 through 13, are chapters that were kept from his second severe letter and ended up being stuck on the end of this so that we would have it. But whichever is the case, we do see a definite change in tone between the end of chapter 9 um, and chapter 10 and following. Okay? Paul's explanation of his ministry, the collection for the saints, chapters 8 and 9, which are called the fundraising letters of the, of the New Testament. I'm involved in professional fundraising for Christian organizations. And so chapters 8 and 9 is just full of material that we, we use and talk about when we're talking about the process of raising, of, of encouraging people to give to kingdom work through not only churches but other Christian organizations as well. Um, and it's rich stuff. It's great. And then Paul's vindication of his apostleship. You'll notice 10 through 13. There's the point at which he turns the corner and... and is being very specific about accusations that have been made against him. Um, so let's talk about that in some specifics. First, Paul uh, gives an explanation for why he has done the things he does and a defense of his apostolic ministry, but in a positive way. The context here early on in the first, first chapters is that I'm so glad to hear from Titus that you all received the letter and the spirit it was intended, even though it was hard, and that you've turned a corner on some stuff and that you still love me, you know, you haven't, my hard letter to you has not broken the relationship. So greetings, thanksgiving for divine comfort and affliction, and Paul talks about his affliction, and how uh, in the midst of all that affliction, it's good to hear that they still have good feelings for it. Now, that affliction, remember, this is after when he was in Ephesus, and the riot was started by the silversmiths, and there was a danger of Paul's being killed. In fact, at one point, they're all gathered in the huge... Uh, arena auditorium, the, the theater in uh, Ephesus, which is still there today, you can go. And they're screaming, and they did this for hours, they're pounding and screaming, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, which is the primary god. The temple to Artemis in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was huge. In fact, people in the ancient times who had visited some of the other wonders of the ancient world said none of them could hold a candle to the spectacular uh, temple to Artemis. So Artemis was the, the, you know, the favorite goddess, the favorite deity. And they saw Paul, because Paul was threatening, was getting more and more people not to worship Artemis, was threatening the economic uh, industry of making and selling idols to Artemis. So they're all stomping and yelling, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. At one point, Paul wants to go into the theater and, talk, and address them. And his other, the other people won't let him because they say, you go in there, they're going to tear you apart. And so they physically prevent him from entering the theater. But in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about when I was in Asia, which means Ephesus. You know, he's in other parts of it. But that, that area was known as Asia. The whole of it we know as Asia Minor. But that particular area is the province of Asia. When I was in Asia, meaning when I was in Ephesus, basically, and I was in threat of death, I had the encouragement, you know, God demonstrated that even though I thought I was a dead man, God demonstrated his grace to me, and now to hear that, you know, our relationship is good is, is a wonderful thing. Um, he talks about the integrity of his motives and conduct, that all of this has been because of a call of God on his life, and he goes into considerable uh, efforts in 2 Corinthians to talk about all that he suffered, to make it clear, I'm not doing this because there's an upside for me, you know, in two different places. He talks about all he has had to suffer because of his ministry and his gospel. And so the things he has done, he has done in obedience to God and for the sake of Corinthian church and other churches. 
Um, he forgives those who had caused offense and encourages them to forgive. Apparently there's at least one, one person in the Corinthian church that had, they had finally called to task and they had punished him. And Paul, Paul doesn't say it was wrong of you to punish him, but he does say, now that the right thing has been done, you need to forgive this person. Okay, if they have repented, then forgive them. Um, he talks about God's direction in his ministry. He refers to the Corinthian believers as being a living letter from Christ. That as they have accepted the gospel through his ministry, they become a living letter as testament to Jesus Christ. All right? Um, he talks about seeing the glory of God with unveiled faces, the treasures in jars of clay, uh, which is an expression, you know, basically meaning we, we and you are, we are jars of clay. We are frail shells, easily broken. And yet in us, as we've accepted Jesus Christ, is the greatest of all treasures. There's actually a band called Jars of Clay, which take their name from, from that. Okay? Um, that the glory that is the treasure of Christ is held even in our weak and easily broken bodies. The prospect of death and what it means for a Christian, he gets into the ministry of reconciliation. Again, encouraging that there be reconciliation, continuing between him and the Corinthian church, and also amongst those who had had conflicts within the church. Uh, he, he calls himself the spiritual father, and he appeals to them as his spiritual children. Um, and then he talks about meeting with Titus, how he had, he had wanted to hear from them, and he was afraid that they had been angry at him, and he went to Troas, and Titus wasn't there, and he thought he was going to be... And then finally, when he gets to uh, Macedonia, he crosses over. He finally meets up with Titus, and Titus brings the positive report. Okay. <clears throat> then we have the two chapters, chapters 8 and 9, which are an encouragement to the Corinthian church to fulfill the promise they had made to give for the needs of the church in Jerusalem. Remember, even though, even though the people in Corinth were not wealthy by Corinthian standards, they tended to be not people of great influence, compared to most places, they probably still were well off. Okay, Somebody who is, who is a modest middle class person in the United States would be wealthy beyond measure in a really poor part of the world. Comparably, those who were of sort of the lower echelon in Corinth still had resources that they could share compared to the people who were, who were starving in a famine in Jerusalem. So Paul encourages their generosity. He tells them that he's going to send Titus and one or perhaps two other people. And the suggestion is that because of the way he talks about them, he doesn't name them. It may have been Barnabas. It may have been Luke. But there were other brothers that were going with Titus uh, to collect the promised gift that the Corinthian church was going to make for the church in, um, in Jerusalem. Now, apparently that one of the things he gets into later is that um, one of the accusations made against him was that he's asking for this money and going to pocket it himself that Paul is going to keep this. So one of the things he's saying here is, I'm sending Titus and two other, you know, a brother, or again elsewhere, just right after that, it seems like he's talking about two other people, that are trusted brothers in the faith. And the way he talks about them, we think maybe Barnabas and Luke, um, to collect the money, and part of that is to say, as a way of saying, just so you know, I'm not taking this money and keeping it myself. Other people that you know and trust are involved in taking up this collection to make sure that we get it back to, to Jerusalem. And then he talks about the results of generous giving, the blessing that God can give as we, you know, as we sow uh, richly, um, we will reap richly of the Lord. Some beautiful passages in there. And then finally, we get to the last section where Paul's tone seems to change. Either because he's gotten another report that was negative, that has told him that there's a faction of the church that are following these super teachers, these false teachers. And so Paul goes into a pretty strong uh, worded defense of his apostolic authority and of what he is called to do by God, the arena of his ministry, that he is doing what God called him to do in the places God has called him to. So no matter what some other teacher says, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ by special appointment, and I came to you because God had called me to you and to the other places I've been to. And then we get into the section where Paul is saying, do these super teachers boast of how wonderful they are and how awful I am? He said, well, I'll tell you what then. Let me, for a few minutes, boast about my credentials. And then he says, I'm foolish for talking like that.
And a couple of places he says, I don't know why I'm going on like this, but you forced me to. And he talks about his own credentials, including what he has suffered for the sake of the gospel. Um, and then, final warnings. Straighten up, people. Stop listening to these false teachers. Follow the gospel I ministered to you, that I talk to you and preach to you, uh, if you are to be obedient to God. And then a final conclusion, final greetings, and a benediction at the end. I would give you probably key verses. There's two. I didn't do it for 1 Corinthians. I, you know, I could do all of 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, or various other things, but there's not quite as obvious. Two of the passages, I think, in 2 Corinthians that really could be considered key verses. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, and 6. For we do not preach ourselves. This is where you know, Paul is being spoken negatively of. But Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And Paul there is talking about as we are reconciled to God in Christ, we must be reconciled to each other. You know, to allow uh, divisions and disunity to continue is against the very spirit of what the gospel is about, which is the gospel is of the spirit of reconciliation. Okay? Any questions about that? Second Corinthians. Well, we're back to First Corinthians. Context, anything. <clears throat> is there any other place where it talks about other than 1 Corinthians 12 where it says, I know a man who was caught up in the third day of the night? Um, no, that's, as far as I can remember off the top of my head, that's the only place Paul talks about that. But again, he does that as a, a testament to his apostleship. When he says, I know a man, again, that was, that's fairly common. That whenever a statement... In, in the New Testament especially, is being made about some great event, it was considered immodest to say, I, Paul, was called up to the third heaven. But he very clearly is talking about himself. And he's saying, not only, they knew the story of him having a divine uh, experience of the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, but in addition to that, as he's talking about his authority to minister, his authority as an apostle, he talks about the fact that he was, he, I knew a man, Paul, was called up to the third heaven and experienced vision. Basically, God gave him the same kind of teaching, apparently, that Jesus spent three years teaching the disciples and the apostles who traveled with him when he was alive. That Paul's knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ is complete because God has miraculously given him that, as he describes it, by, by calling him up into the third heaven. The third heaven in those days, uh, uh, people thought the sky that we see is the first heaven. The stars beyond that is the second heaven. The, the, the place where God lives, heaven, is the third heaven. So they had this sort of hierarchical view. It, you know, they, they sometimes will talk about the fact that they also had uh, a tripart view of existence in terms of earth being where we live, the sky being where God lives, and, and the, you know, underground being where the devil lives. That's hell. But they did have a sense that the heavens were broken up into the sky we see, the stars beyond that, and heaven where God exists beyond that. Okay? Um, and that's Paul's claim to apostleship, to the authority equal to any of the other apostles. And, by the way, that's an authority that the other apostles accepted. Because Paul worked with, traveled with, knew Peter, James, who was the, uh, and others... Uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was head of the Jerusalem Council, but one, when one place is called an apostle as well. So the apostles were not just the twelve that Jesus originally selected. Um, and so, you know, Paul is making a point. No matter what somebody else is telling you, I have a right to that title. I have a right to that authority. Okay? Marvin? Back to the reconciliation. Um, it's so, so important that we do forgive one another, and I'm always aware when we do the Lord's Prayer that there's something incumbent upon us there. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass right. against us. Yeah. Judge not lest ye be judged is the converse of that. Yeah. Basically it means as we forgive, we can be forgiven. 
Okay, right. No pagans of the time that this was written uh, engaging in the ecstatic tongues that part of the work. Uh, I can't speak to that. Um, ecstatic tongues. I know that there were um, sort of hysterical manifestations in some of the pagan cults. I think of that as being more the mystery religions than the standard. One of the things about the the Greco-Roman pantheons, you know, the Greek and Roman pantheons, which are the same gods with different names, is they were really boring. Um, in fact, one of the reasons why the mystery religions came along, and one of the reasons why the Greco-Roman world was so open to Christianity, you know, actually to Judaism, monotheism, but they didn't like the whole idea of circumcision and the other things that went along with being a Jew. Uh, one of the reasons is because people were worn out on the old gods. They, they didn't see what you got out of them anymore. You know, they want us to sacrifice and they want us to do temple worship and all that, but there's no sense of relationship. There was no doctrine of salvation. There was no sense in which you got anything other than hopefully the gods wouldn't hurt you if you appeased them in some way. But there was, there was very little sense of being actively involved in anything like ecstatic. The mystery religions came along, and one of the things they offered were were ecstatic kinds of worship, you know, like Mithraism, where you had the Torah Bolium, where they sacrificed a, you know, very dramatic sacrifice a bull and spread the blood all over people, and, you know, dancing around fires, and all, you know, that, that, where a very different kind of thing. That's one of the reasons the mystery religions also grew during that time. But I'm not aware of any of the standard Greek worship, like Apollo or Aphrodite or the others, uh, having anything like ecstatic utterances. You would really have to stretch stretch this to, 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 to make it to make this in Corinthians uh, align with what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, it's two different things. Yeah, I don't think Paul is suggesting that they're doing something pagan. Because he defends speaking in tongues. You know exactly. he says it's a it's a right thing but it has to be done in the right way. And that the will of the prophet, you know, or the you know the, the person who's expressing these gifts, you have control over it. You know, you, you are not being carried away with an ecstatic utterance. Like the reason the reason I brought up the pagans engaging in the ecstatic tongues is that's one of the ways of attacking tongues in the, in the uh, yeah. church. That's yeah. what I've heard. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I, I know something about the you know the, those religions. That's some of the talks I've done. I'm not aware of anything like that in, in anything other than mystery religions, which would not have been the standard kind of pagan you know, temple worship that they would have had in Corinth. So, anything else, Mike or uh, Kit? Also in chapter 12, where Paul talks about he had a, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan, who left with me. Um, is there any teaching, anything at all, to indicate that that was anything other than a physical ailment? No. People have said, you know, I've had that question asked of me. Well, is this a spiritual thing? Is it a demonic possession or is it something else? No. I, there's no indication of that because he says a thorn in the flesh. Um, Paul apparently had some disability that he suffered with. And we believe it was likely that he had weak eyes. Because at one point he is talking about when he had spent some time staying over uh, in the Galatian churches, he says, I know that you would have done anything you could for me. In fact, you would have torn your eyes out for me if that would have helped. Elsewhere, he at the end of a couple of his books, he says... And these last words, I write in my own hand, see how large the letters are. Indicating that Paul's eyesight was so bad that he, he always had a secretary. He always had somebody writing for him. But that as a special way of saying, you know, a, a final greeting, Paul would write the last parts of it, but he had to write in really large letters because his eyes were so bad he could not write small. So the fairly standard, not everybody agrees with this, I don't... There's not any serious belief that it was not something physical, because he says it's a thorn in the flesh, and that he's, you know, he's prayed for release from that. It's not a spiritual ailment, in other words. But uh, the most common interpretation from all those other clues is that it probably was he had such bad eyesight that he could not, you know, he couldn't even write without somebody doing other than a few words in large letters. So, and that that was. You know, and that's a beautiful passage because he says three times I asked the Lord you know, to take this from me and each time the Lord says no because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. The ultimate example of strength made perfect in weakness of course is the cross. That at the time of greatest defeat 
apparently, by everybody else's expectation, you know, Jesus being betrayed and humiliated, um, deserted, and given the worst possible punishment that only the worst of criminals were uh, committed to, at that moment of ultimate, apparent, despairing defeat, the greatest victory of all eternity happened. But that's not, that, what looked like the ultimate weakness was a demonstration of an almighty power and a great strength. So that's the ultimate example of that. And Paul, I believe, saw himself as in his own weakness in the flesh, that God, in a similar way, would take his weakness and in that very weakness would prove his own strength. That it's not, it's the same reason in the class yesterday we were talking about Gideon and the judges. And God said, no, I don't want you to take your whole army down there and fight those guys because then you'll think it was because you were strong enough. I want you to do it with 300 guys because then you'll know that it was the power of God that accomplished this, not your own strength. Well, that's basically what Paul experienced. That despite his very serious limitation, in the very midst of that weakness, God's strength was proven. Because look what he did. You know. All right, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. I'll see some of you tomorrow in systematics. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you next week.